Thank you so much for coming out on a Thursday evening. This feels so special after so long, it feels like, to be in person having this experience. Uh, I want to thank you for joining us today from the Chapman Center for Rural Studies. My name is Mary Kahn. I direct the center. And we have the privilege of working with an incredible team on this project that we're going to be sharing with you today. Um, I would like to start off by thanking Kansas Humanities, who has generously provided us with funding for this project and is making it possible. Uh, while we're doing a panel today, and sharing information with you today, I do want to let you know that the primary thing that we're working on is a digital exhibit that anyone can access from anywhere online, because we want this to have big impact. Now, we've titled this project, Kansas Without the Kanza, Understanding How the Kanza Homeland Became K-State. And uh, I hope you notice we have the Kanza, the Ka, language uh, transcription of the Kanza name up here. Uh, the Ka have been doing amazing work linguistically revitalizing their language. And so we want to celebrate that when we get the chance here. For me, as director of the Chapman Center, this project uh, was an obvious choice to support uh, because the Chapman Center Sorry, hold on one second. I'm trying to advance slides, and my Zoom bar keeps on popping up over my slide advancer. There we go. Okay. So we're all learning new technology here, aren't we? Um, the Chapman Center may be best known for our Lost Towns projects, and I think these are really special projects. Mark Chapman, in 2005, started supporting the Chapman Center. He was born and raised in Kansas and was a K-State alum, and he generously supported our uh, center to help us uncover the story of Lost Towns. Mark Chapman's story uh, begins in Broughton, Kansas, which was condemned in 1966 by the Army Corps of Engineers uh, for flood control. So all, when we have no flooding in Manhattan, we can thank the sacrifice of communities like this. Mark thought it was important that we remember these towns. And I think we've done incredible work uncovering the story of the people who built these towns and came from these towns. But this also reminds me of another town that was flooded in the 1970s. And that was Washinga, Oklahoma. Washinga, Oklahoma is where the Ka Tribal Council House and the Tribal Cemetery was located in 1970. So I feel like it's a natural fit for the Chapman Center, when we remember these lost towns, to also remember other lost stories of towns that have also been forgotten in these kinds of ways. And that brings us to the story that was brought across my desk about a year ago which asked the question, how did the Kanza homeland become K-State? And this is the question we're going to be exploring today. Now, I am not an expert in this area, but luckily we have a panel of really incredibly, incredible scholars here who worked together to uh, start this project and build this digital exhibit. So I would like to introduce Lisa Tatinetti, a professor of English at K-State. Charlie Huffman, who's going to be joining us online, she's in the background here. We don't have her screen, a face on the screen yet. Uh, uh, Ty Edwards, uh, uh, associate professor of history and director of the Johnson County Community College at K uh, Kansas Studies Institute. Chester Hus Hubbard, who's a senior in geography at K-State and a Prairie Band uh, Potawatomi Nation member. And Kinsley Searles, who's a senior in English at K-State. We're very excited to be sharing these stories with you today. And I just want to give you fair warning, we will have plenty of time for uh, questions at the end. We may run a little long. If we go over our talking time, because we are talkers, please feel <laughs> free to leave if you need to leave. But we hope that you'll join the conversation with us. Uh, with that in mind, I'm going to pass the mic over to... Land acknowledgement? Oh, yes. And very importantly, we're going to do a quick <laughs> land acknowledgement before I pass 
the mic over to Dr. Tatanetti. Okay. Hi, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> was all working like clockwork just a second ago. We have many pieces of tech up at the same time. There, <laughs> there we, we go. go. <laughs> As the first land grant institution established in the 1862 Moral Act, we acknowledge that the state of Kansas is historically home to many native nations, including the Cobb, Osage, and Pawnee, among others. Furthermore, Kansas is the current home to four federally recognized native nations, Grand Van Potawatomi, the Kickapoo Tribe of Kansas, the Iowa Tribe of Kansas and Nebraska, and the Sac and Fox Nation of Missouri and Kansas and Nebraska. Many native nations utilize the western plains of Kansas for their hunting grounds, and others, such as the Delaware, were moved through this region during Indian removal. Hold on one second. We are going to make this tech work. <laughs> 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 okay, let's try this again. As the first land grant institution established in the 1862 War Act, we acknowledge that the state of Kansas is historically home to many native nations, including the Kaw, Osage, and Pawnee, among others. So, Dr. Tatanetti, how about we go to you? <laughs> all right, all right, we will, because I will acknowledge where we're at. Working here. Let's see. Okay, does this work? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. And hold on, I have a timer. Eight minutes. If I go over eight minutes, pull me off with one of those, <laughs> you know, with one of those things. Hold on. But I have to see it or it's not going to count. Here we go. Hi, I'm Lisa Tatnetti, and I'm a settler scholar who works in queer indigenous studies. Um, I teach multi-ethnic lit. I teach film at K-State, and I'm the secretary of the Indigenous Faculty of Snap Alliance there. Um, I wanted to start by saying that we are all here today because every one of us here, whether we're native or non-native, stands on native land. Um, and that is, I would argue, our responsibility to recognize that fact um, and to educate ourselves about the past and current indigenous nations whose land we stand on. So that work is being supported by the Chapman Center and I believe that that work is imperative. Um, as an educator, I want to give you an example. I have taught Native Lit at K-State for almost 17 years. It is only this past semester, 17 years, okay? It's only this past semester that I had my first student come into class who knew that Kansas State University stands on Kaw land um, and exists because the Kansa people were forcibly and often illegally removed from their homelands to make way for white settlers. So we can have a productive conversation. Um, I want to start by getting us all on the same page and talking terms. Uh, and then I'll give you a really brief overview of the Caw Treaties that undergird this project. So you're going to hear us say most often indigenous. Um, you can also use Native American. Um, American Indian is the term the US government still uses most often. But it's always best, if you can, to use tribally specific terms. So in this case, today, we're going to be talking about um, the Kansa people and the Kaw Nation. And our, our collaborator, Charlie Huffman, who's in the background here, but will be forefront later, always reminds us, when we're talking about that moment of treaties, which we'll be talking about, we're talking about the Kansa people. Um, they became the formally recognized Kaw Nation, but that didn't happen until the 20th century. Um, also, uh, as I talk about in my classrooms, Tribe and nation are terms that you can use interchangeably. So the U.S. Constitution uses tribe and uses nation interchangeably. And that's something important to recognize because we're talking about treaties here. And those are compacts between sovereign nations. All right? And so that's where we get to tribal sovereignty. Um, tribes are not states. Uh, and I think a lot of people in the U.S. Uh, who are non-native don't recognize what that means. So the Kaw Nation, the four current tribes in Kansas, the Prairie Band Potawatomi, the Kickapoo, the Sauk and Fox, the Iowa, are all federally recognized nations that have tribal sovereignty. And that means a nation's power to self-govern. And that is, at the, that is at the heart of where we are 
um, going to go today. So I am really quickly going to give you an overview of the treaties that undergird this project. It's coming. It's coming. I'll start talking while we, while we work the click out. Um, so you're going to see when this comes up that I start by the Santa Fe Trail. I think, has everybody hands here? Have you heard of the Santa Fe Trail? <laughs> yes? Okay. It was really celebrated last year. All right. Um, so Kansas, we talk about the Santa Fe Trail all the time. But the reality is if you were an indigenous person and your nation um, had lands that the Santa Fe Trail passed over, that was an apocalypse for your people. Um, and we'll look at this and talk about why. So these are treaties of land session. There was actually a treaty before this, but we're talking about what it means for land session. The Treaty of 1825 reduced the tribe, the, the Kansa people's land from 20 million acres to a 30 mile wide, 2 million acre reservation that starts just west of where Topeka is now. That's a 96% decrease in their homelands. The promised annuities were seldom delivered. There were issues with unscrupulous traders and disease because of the people that were bringing it in as they came across the trail was also this massive issue. Um, and one of the things that we see, there are promises, and we talk about this in our treaty work, that, it's, that this land is going to be theirs forever. But within, look, 1825, by 1846, we have another treaty of session, and Chester is going to show us a map of this. Um, the Kansa came to the Treaty of 1846 table on, this, on the heels of a lot of hardship. So as people were coming on the trail, they were overgrazing the land, they were overhunting, and in fact, it wasn't just to eat, there was an incredible amount of hunting for sport that is really well documented. So buffalo were being killed just for tongues. And basically, the Kansa hunting territories um, were being decimated. At the same time then, um, we have railroad town speculators coming through. And the Treaty of 1846 is them getting the land they want. And so it reduces Kansa territory to now 256,000 acres in present day Council Grove, Kansas. And that is a problem. Um, so what happens at that point is that settlers are knowingly flouting treaty boundaries. They are moving into Council Grove knowingly and purposely with the idea that if there are enough white folks there, then they will get the US government to give them that land. This is, there is no question here. We have historical documentation about this. And what happens as they flout treaty boundaries is they settle illegally on Kansa treaty land. They build houses, they erect fences, they graze livestock. And the Kansa are attempting to plant, to do what the US government is asking them to do, all right? Because they want them to, to um, plant in certain kinds of ways. And Kinsley is gonna, Kinsley's gonna talk about this. Um, but the reality is, is that when they do that, we get the settlers' livestock grazing their lands. And then when they seize, for example, a cow that's grazing on their land, there are um, disagreements and they are called, uh, they're called, actually there's, there's a bunch of things that happen during this time, um, but they're called thieves, even though it's on their land. So in June 1859, two young Kansa men are lynched um, at Council Grove because one of these altercations. Um, and that is one of the things that precipitates the Treaty of 1859. Um, and in the Treaty of 1859, then, removes Council Grove from Kansa lands and gives the tribe only 80,000 of the poorest acres subdivided into 40-acre plots for each family, which is not the way the Kansa held land. It was not the way they wanted to hold land then. Uh, but that is what the US government said had to happen. Um, what we see here is what noted Dakota scholar Philip Deloria calls a pattern of defensive conquest. So it's a mistaken belief that peaceful white settlers are forced into conflict by native aggression. And that's an inaccurate story of settler innocence and indigenous violence. That's been retold endlessly. If I have any folks in here who, like my dad read Westerns growing up, okay? Like you see this story again and again and again. And the irony here is in 1861, we get Kansas statehood. And that's a classic example of settler colonialism. Kansas becomes a state, takes the name of the Kansas people, 
all right? But then those people are pushed out of their homelands. So in May of 1872, over the strong protests of the Kanza people, and especially Chief Alagoejo, a federal act moves the Kanza off of their homelands and to what will become Kay County, Oklahoma. So in the space, as you see, of only 50 years, um, we get the decimation of where, the lands where they buried their people, um, where they had lived for generations. Um, and I, the last thing I will say before I pass it to Chester uh, is that we don't want to end on a story of disappearance, all right? Indigenous people are not disappeared. They're all over here. They're in this room all over right now, they're sitting at this table. Um, and what Charlie reminds us all the time is the Kaw Nation survives and thrives, okay? And that is the story. The Kaw Nation has a childhood development center. It's got healthcare clinics, wellness center, tribal police, and really importantly, as Mary brought up, the Kanza E, the Kanza language, um, is being redeveloped. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Chester. Uh, I'm a student here at Kansas State University, also a member of the Prairie Band Potawatomi Nation. Oh, sorry, excuse me. <laughs> it's, a long, it's been a long semester. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but yeah, so I, I uh, made this map uh, with the, uh, la the Kansas Land Treaties Project, and it helps to show the, uh, the cons of land sessions between 1825 and 1847. And the first session is, <coughs> sorry, oh my goodness, uh, is the, uh, the first boundary. Alright, cool, sorry. <laughs> uh, but, so there, there's uh, three different types of borders here. So the first border is the largest one, it's the hollow border. And it helps show the, the Treaty of 1825. And that kind of helps show just how much land they lost. <laughs> well, each of these do. But uh, so then the next tree that is shown on here is the solid border one, which you can see that goes uh, over the Smoky Hills and Manhattan. And that's the solid border. And that's the 1846 treaty. And then after that, uh, there's just this little dotted border down there in the, oh, just a little bit southeast of, of, uh, no, not Council Grove. Yeah, Council Grove. Yeah. And uh, that, that's basically where they ended up after all those trees. Ended up, or after all those trees. And then eventually now it's gone. And they went to Oklahoma. But maps like this help show the, um, oh, it helps show the history of people that are no longer here on this land. Like, my own people's uh, history isn't this land. We were forced, we were first, ah, we were forced to move here back in the 1800s, but this, this is Kanza land, and so maps like this can help to show the history that isn't really talked about, but, yeah, yeah sorry, I also forgot to mention, but so the purple parcels of land are the, <coughs> are the uh, parcels of land that was eventually given to Kansas State University uh, by the U.S. government. Oh, my goodness. God. Apologize. It's been a while since I've spoken this much. <laughs> but, so, yeah, so the purple uh, plots of land helped show the parcels of land that were eventually granted to the Kansas State University by the United States government. Now, there, there's a whole lot more that was given to other universities, but we're only focusing on Kansas State University. And as I was saying, like the history and all this, it, it helps to decolonize geography. Now, for those of you who don't really know what decolonizing is, it's, it's a way of challenging like 
Western knowledge and concepts using indigenous knowledge, history, and just kind of ways. Because a lot of that was ignored <laughs> way back in the day. And a lot of maps don't include a lot of indigenous histories. So decolonizing geography is important because it helps to show the history of the land in a way that uh, respects the people that used to live here. Hello, everyone. My name is Kinsley Searles, and I'm an undergraduate student at Kansas State University. Um, and I was helping with this research project. I started in the spring of 2021. Um, and I became interested in this project because as a K-State student and someone who has lived in Kansas for my whole life, we often hear about how Kansas State is the first land-grant institution. And this is said with a lot of pride, a lot of celebration. Um, but I was curious because I know that all land we are on is indigenous land. So I was curious about where the true origins of this land was, which is what led me to this project. So in this project, I worked with a one specific treaty that you heard Dr. Tatnetti mention earlier. It's the first one, the Treaty of 1825. Um, and it was the first of three treaties that had a major, major impact on the Kanza people and the Ka Nation today. So with this treaty, what I aim to do is create annotations because we read these treaties and we read the articles and we, we look at them and they seem kind of black and white when you look at them at first, right? So it says, in exchange for this amount of land, you will receive this amount of money. But in reality, there is so much more that goes into that. It is so much more complicated than you can tell from first glance. So that's why these annotations are important because I would point out areas that specifically talked about like some language that um, was used with a purpose from the United States, or um, I noted some people and explained their histories. Um, and so throughout this process, the entire point of the annotations is basically to create more context because that's really needed with these treaties because we only hear one side of the story, which is the US perspective. So um, as part of the research I did to create these annotations, I conducted a oral history with a local scholar, Ron Parks. Um, he's the author of Darkest Period, The Kanza Indians in Their Last Homeland. Um, and he's very knowledgeable about the Kanza during this time period. So when I was interviewing him, and you're about to hear a clip of this interview as well, um, we were discussing one article, which if you'll remember, Dr. Tatnetti talked about how the uh, Kanza were supposed to receive an amount of livestock agriculture in for the land. Um, so we were talking about this article, and then he mentioned that although it seems really simple, like it seems very simple, you receive a livestock, you receive tools for agriculture. It was actually, it required a cultural revolution of the Kanza due to their gender roles at the time. So this is uh, an excerpt from that interview. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> we knew this was coming. <laughs> to do was what, what the government was asking the Kansas to do was, was a major cultural revolution in terms of gender roles. Okay, because the Kansas are a horticultural people. They raised corn, beans, plants, and squash, later watermelons, potatoes, um, and, and some sunflowers. But that is women's work. Okay, and the women, I mean, when, when, um, when Thomas Day uh, came to the uh, Blue Earth Village, um, just right here uh, uh, close to Manhattan, um, I believe that was in 18, 19, 18, 20, um, he, he had uh, said that they have about 100 acres uh, of, in um, of agriculture. And they're raising these crops, and the women are doing the work. Um, sometimes men would pitch in with some of the heavier work, but for the most part, of it is women's work. Well, when they got to Council Grove and they uh, began to uh, 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 try to provide some training 
um, for like the students that they call mission to uh, the, who are all boys by the way to become uh, farmers um, they ran into opposition from the old line conservative uh, uh, male hierarchy of the tribe who refused that they weren't going to do women's work and they didn't want their sons to do women's work so that was that was one of those those solutions like well we need to get the Kansas to function as property owning farmers and of course males are the ones that you know are supposed to be doing that in the Euro-American modality anyway and uh, but they ran smack dab into cultural barriers simply because of the, you know, the hundreds of years of uh, of that being a, a gender specific role. Okay, so as you can see from this excerpt in the interview, even the smallest, tiniest details within a treaty, this is literally about exchange, which is what a treaty is about, is so much more complicated than it appears on paper. Because you have this agriculture that's being traded, but in reality, it's requiring an entire cultural revolution for a group of people. Um, and this is because ultimately these treaties are not about land, they're about assimilation. And as the farther I got into this project, the more resistant I got to the idea of even calling these documents treaties, because honestly they're not, because treaties by definition are, between, are an agreement between two sovereign nations. And the United States did not consider the cause sovereign, I would argue they still don't see the cause sovereign. In addition, this wasn't an agreement because an agreement has two willing parties, and treaties are formed upon coercion, manipulation, lies, specifically with this treaty, but I would argue with most, if not all, treaties with indigenous nations across the United States. So what we're seeing here is when you just look at these documents as black and white, and you don't receive the context, you're missing out on a major part of the history that's here, and that's continuing to contribute to the erasure, because the United States, government at that time would love you to have read that article and said, sounds good to me, that must have been what happened, but it's not. And so by doing these annotations, we really want to focus on the truth of what happened. And like one of our goals of this project was to center an indigenous perspective, but in all honesty, it's more about like revealing the truth of what happened. This is like the true history. And I think like we can still see this happening today, like as a K-State student, when I attend the university that where m many, many people talk about how wonderful it is that it's a land grant institution without talking about the true history of the land, it's continuing to contribute to that erasure. And that is such a massive problem. So these annotations are aiming to combat that in order to bring light to some of the issues, bring light to the fact that the cost still exists. And that's why I think these annotations are ultimately important. I think Kinsley might have set us up really perfectly to play the land acknowledgement. <laughs> yeah, good point. <laughs> We're going to try this again. As the first land grant institution established under the 1862 Morrill Act, we acknowledge that the state of Kansas is, historically, home to many native nations, including the Kaw, Osage, and Pawnee, among others. Furthermore, Kansas is the current home to four federally recognized native nations, the Prairie Band Potawatomi, the Kickapoo Tribe of Kansas, the Iowa Tribe of Kansas and Nebraska, and the Sac and Fox Nation of Missouri in Kansas and Nebraska. Many Native nations utilized the western plains of Kansas as their hunting grounds, and others, such as the Delaware, were moved through this region during Indian removal efforts to make way for white settlers. It's important to acknowledge this, since the land that serves as the foundation of this institution was, and still is, stolen land. We remember these truths because K-State's status as a land-grant institution is a story that exists within ongoing settler colonialism, and rests on the dispossession of indigenous peoples and nations from their lands. These truths are often invisible to many. The recognition that K-State's history begins and continues through indigenous contexts is essential. 
Please remember these truths because we still remember. <laughs> so we'd like to invite two of our experts to continue the conversation because this conversation does <laughs> Congratulations to Bryson Hyde. <laughs> but we would like to invite two of our experts to continue talking about these issues because uh, we do believe that this requires context. Uh, so we're going to invite our panel member uh, Charlie Huffman and Ty Edwards to continue this conversation uh, together uh, to sort of help provide some of that context. All right. Hey, Charlie, can you hear me? Hello, Ty. Hey, Daji. Hey, Daji. Wave a hand for being here. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm happy to be here. I can't see you, but I can hear you. So okay. we're going to. Should we turn it on so she can see me? We can do this. Can you see me now? Ah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> okay, so Char I'm Ty Edwards, by the way, history professor at Johnson County Community College, Kansas Studies Institute director. And Charlie and I have a sort of long relationship over several years. We've done numerous projects together. Um, if some of you have heard about the Between the Rock and a Hard Place project in Lawrence, Kansas, uh, that's related to what is sometimes called the Big Red Rock, which is a sacred boulder to the Kaw Nation that used to sit in the Kansas River near Tecumseh. And uh, the city of Lawrence, you may know, stole it out of the river in 1929, flopped it in the city park, uh, slapped a plaque on it to, that is in honor of the founders of the city of Lawrence, which desecrated, of course, that item. Uh, and it's sat in that park ever since, um, not really to anyone's real notice uh, for the last probably 50 years. And so we were part of a project to bring awareness to that uh, in the community. And that resulted in uh, the Kaw Nation requesting the rematriation of Injuje Wahobe, which is what the Kaw call it. And uh, the city and the county unanimously agreed to do that. And now Charlie and I are part of a Mellon Foundation grant that just started in April, uh, which is funding actually moving the rock to Kaw owned land at Alagawejo Park, which is near Council Grove today. Um, so we're really excited to start on that project. and. Uh, Charlie and I spent hours and hours on Zoom, <laughs> uh, working together, writing things, uh, and I hopefully, I believe you have it in your links to Robinson Park on the website. We wrote some curriculum, too, and interviewed Curtis Kikabi, who's a Kaw Nation elder, and he talks about uh, the, the sacredness, and he's talking to other Kaw children about uh, the importance of that rock. So I recommend if any of you go to that website, it's robinsonpark1929.com, uh, you can listen to to Curtis talk about that and understand that in that context. So today, uh, Charlie and I are going to talk about this project, because we've also been working a lot with our great friends here on the treaty annotations. Uh, so Charlie, you ready for me to just jump in? I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, right, so Charlie, tell us about why you were interested in working on the treaty annotation project. OK, um, can you hear me? Yes. All right, so for, you know, everybody set this up so beautifully um, from, from Lisa to, to Chester to Kinsley, and, you know, you guys made some really beautiful points, um, and I agree with so many of them, uh, the consent versus coercion, uh, this idea of um, land-based education, uh, these are so important, but uh, for my family, in particular, um, we have a story of diaspora. Um, I did not grow up in Kaw City, Oklahoma, even, right? So, you know, Mary, when you're talking about the flood, right? Um, you know, for my family, um, the 60s, the 70s, that was a good time to get out of Dodge. Um, even, right, from the place that we had been sent to die, um, so for me, this treaty project is um, incredible because it tells me so much about how my family wound up um, scattered 
Um, you know, there's so much context and nuance that is there to be explored, and um, you know, it is ultimately a story of, of survival and of coming back together. Um, and these documents um, provide a, a means of doing that. There are as many stories as there are about Kamsa and Kashinga. Um, and, you know, this is a, a place to begin. Awesome. Awesome. Okay, so Charlie, what do you think most people, especially non indigenous Kansans, what do you think they do not understand about Kansa history in your homeland? <laughs> um, wow. Um, so, you know, when you when when I tell people that uh, you know that I'm caught, right, and I, I start and I'm real soft about it. I say, you know, hey, we're Ka, we're Kanza. <laughs> hey, have you heard of the state of Kansas? <laughs> you know. <laughs> Uh, so even if, if people are from Kansas and they say, oh yeah, I'm from Kansas, um, they don't know. They don't know that that's where the name from the name is from. So I would say right there is, is a an important piece, and and then that we're still here, and that we belong to that land. You know, <coughs> when we talking about the context of these treaties, and you know, Kinsley really had an excellent point about the cultural context of these treaties. You know, one of the things um, that, they, that we haven't really addressed yet, uh, but we're working on it, there's so much to do, <laughs> but, you know, is that um, I don't know how to articulate it, but, it, you know, we inhabit the land there. Uh, we belong to it. Our ancestors are buried there. You know, there's a word in our language, uh, it's shoki, and it means to return to one's home. I mean, two syllables, right? Shoki, and, and it means to return to one's home. So there's so much uh, when we talk about land and belonging, um, you know, that we've only begun to scratch the surface. So as far as like the history of the land in Kansas, I think a lot of people, um, you know, we don't, there's not the education available even. I mean, I, I've read the, the materials that are for seventh grade in, you know, the state Kansas curriculum. And, you know, it, it's just not even there. Um, so, I think there's a lot that's not known. And a, a land-based education, I mean, you know, the idea of decolonizing geography, how cool. You know, so if we can look and we can say, you know, this is the story of what happened. Um, that'd be good. Yeah, awesome. Real quick while we're doing that, since we have, you can see this website, I thought I'd put that up real quick and then you can maybe see. Let's do this so you can see. That's in Juju Wahobe. So people can see that while we're talking to Charlie. I like I like having the two of you <laughs> up on the screen together. Um, okay, so can you share how this story relates to Kanza life today? Or did I skip one, Charlie? No. Uh, I can't sure. remember. I I, I think mean, I maybe did. We'll talk about whatever. Okay. So, <laughs> what impact do you hope will come from this treaty annotation specifically? Maybe we should focus on that. Yeah. Uh, sure. Um, I I would love this to be a springboard for education. You know, the the kind of education um, that you know that has to follow land acknowledgement. You know, when we when we talk about um, land acknowledgement and we say things like, well, you know, we're on native land or we're on uh, stolen land or this is a land grant university and, and we, we acknowledge that, you know, what follows has to be some kind of education 
you know, there's so many mythologies that are still out there. You know, there's the mythology that um, uh, that indigenous people, you know, uh, Native American people still get a free education. Well, I really wish I could tell my stupid phone uh, creditors that, you know, you know <laughs> that'd be great. Um, there's a whole lot of things that, you know, um, we need to sort of dispel and, uh, you know, talk about, like, if, if that land was supposed to provide us an education, if that's what the treaty says, then maybe these universities, maybe we can talk about that. I mean, that's, whoo, <laughs> um, that's a lot. But, you know, um, these are the kind of conversations that need to follow a land acknowledgement. Um, you know, if, it's, if, it's, if we're serious about a land-based education, if we're serious about um, what it means to be living uh, together and, and to be talking about um, historical presence. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Okay, thank you, Charlie. I always love listening to Charlie talk. Uh, okay, so can you share how this story relates to Khan's life today? Oh, boy. Um, you know, it, it's interesting. Um, I would think that because these treaties were so important to how the state was made, I would think that they would be required reading for every student in Kansas. Um, you know, but they're, they're not. Um, how it relates to our life, I mean, I, I wonder, <laughs> for me, you know, when I see news articles about mascots, you know, in high schools, um, and when I see uh, history books that don't include us, <coughs> when I see um, things that are named after us that have no connection to us, so appropriation, I know that those treaties were very effective in, in the way that Kinsley was talking about, in the way of, of assimilation and erasure. I think that the wrongness of them still relates to my life. You know, that's when we talk about um, intergenerational trauma, when we talk about the lasting effects, when we talk about, um, you know, and, and there's newspaper articles from, you know, all through the late 1800s and, you know, going on and calling us names. And then you have things like that bicycle race that only recently stopped, that continued to use those same epithets about our people. You know, how it relates to us is in the, the wrongness of it. Um, it's just my opinion. Thank you so much. Anything else, Charlie, you want to talk about about the project? Oh, I'm real glad we're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so grateful. Um, you know, I'm everybody that's put the tech together to do it, and for all of you that came to listen uh, with me, I'm just um, so thankful for your interest and, uh, you know, 
my my voice on this is not by any means the only one. We would really like to have more Kalazinika uh, Shinga um, look at these and talk about these. And, Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you, Charlie. I'm going to turn it over to our next colleague, and I'll turn the camera back so you can see our wonderful friends that are with us. <laughs> so we would like to thank you for joining us today. And uh, this is a reminder that uh, while we're having a conversation here today, what we, are, what we are attempting to do is build a resource that people can access online with lots of information about this and with treaties that are attached, with oral histories that are attached, with additional resources that are attached. We have some items already up. We hope to have the rest of them up by the end of the summer. Uh, we would like to open up the conversation uh, with the audience. We would like to hear from you about uh, this project and about your thoughts and uh, include you in this conversation here. Uh, so we're going to welcome questions. Uh, uh, Dr. Tatanetti, are you going to help field them? or? Yes, yes with the mic. I will help field them. And, and we were going to actually start with one more uh, question for the students, yeah. yes. um, which is what, is this, what does this project mean to you, being involved in it? Did you wanna, do you want to say anything? <coughs> And then, and so that way you're percolating and then you're ready to jump in <laughs> with your questions. So something that I mentioned before that I'm from Kansas, um, and I just think it's unbelievable that I just recent, very recently learned this history. Um, I went to school in Kansas, yet I had not, like I knew of the Kansa as a people, I knew the state was named for them, but that's pretty much all my knowledge. That's where it ended. So I think that if we had these educational resources in the classroom, it would just be fantastic for students who grow up in a state that's named after the Ka. And like, I, it's everywhere you look, like even in Manhattan, like the Blue Village Plaza where the Adidas Bakehouse is, like that's named after Blue Earth Village, which was a Ka village. And so it's like literally everywhere. Um, and the fact that I didn't learn it, and what I did learn, it's like looking back on it now, is only like perpetuating these issues because I, like, you learn about indigenous people, but you mer very much learn about them in, like, a very past. Like, there's something that happened in the past. No, indigenous people are still here. Um, and I think that, like, with our school culture, too, like, I went to a school with an appropriated mascot, yet I still didn't learn this history. And so it's just something... I don't know. I just think it needs to be added into curriculum younger. Like now as I look back on it after having learned this history, really, really wishing that I had known it before. Okay. Hello. Hey, here we go. Ooh, God, we're going to first row. Let's see. Uh, for me, uh, I grew up in, you know, rural Kansas, you know, in a small town. And uh, even though, you know, I'm indigenous, didn't hear too much about Oh, Kanza or Ka, even though, you know, um, I, I did hear about them, you know, from my family, you know, t telling me about how, you know, you know, this is our original homelands. Uh, but, uh, like, just from our education system, didn't really hear too much about that. And then uh, I was also a student teacher before I changed to geography, funny enough. Uh, and I was in Lawrence. And uh, even though, uh, like, even though the curriculum has gone better, like, there's still you know, not a whole lot of representation in the knowledge or nothing like that. So, like, something like this is, would have, like, a really nice impact, especially on the, oh, on the indigenous youth who don't really see themselves in, his, in the history other than, you know, they're just gone. <laughs> like, they, they were here, now they're gone. <laughs> but, like, it, it, it'd be real good for them to see that. Thanks, both of you. Is that on? Yeah. Is this on? <laughs> so, so questions, and we will ask you to talk through the mic because we're recording, and that, and also that way Charlie can hear you. So, so questions, thoughts, re reactions. Uh, okay, kids, I thought you told me you were this smart when I was sitting next to you in class. <laughs> I could have gotten a way better grade. But, um, I'm sure you did great. Does this, do you plan to go 
any further with this? Is there going to be like uh, any of the other tribes, like their interaction with the Ka? Or is it going to be just kind of isolated to like the treaty? Oh, you want me to answer? Yeah, answer. <laughs> oh, well, Mary, maybe Mary and Lisa should answer. Yeah. Now, our, I think our plan is, if it's fair to say, is to finish the annotations on these treaties. And then the project that I'm on and that Charlie is on, so the sacredredrock.com project um, that Mellon grants, so we're going to create curriculum and we're going to create a book from that uh, through University Press of Kansas. Uh, so I think that that's our launch pad, but I mean, if we can get money, <laughs> we, can, we can keep doing some of this work. Um, we have a plan to do other nations yet, um, but we have talked about that, yeah. And I know, if any of you know about the controversy that happened with the Secretary of Education a few weeks ago, um, so Randy Watson here in Kansas made some comments on a recorded Zoom event where um, he basically said that when he was a kid, his cousins used to come to visit Kansas and they were afraid of tornadoes and he said, well, you should have been afraid of Indians attacking. Um, and I think he was trying to point out that both are nonsense. I think that was what he was trying to say. But of course, most Kansans don't know that the second one is nonsense. <laughs> um, and so there was a lot of controversy. He, uh, the State Board of Ed put him on and he, he resigned. They rejected his resignation. He was put on like a 30 day leave. Um, and so we just had a meeting, Lisa and I were at it on Friday with the Kansas Association of Native American Education. And they were speaking to the State Board of Ed and to Randy Watson specifically about how do we change this for young people, right? Especially the K through 12 um, population. So I think you're gonna see a bunch of content created. Um, and I think what the goal is, is to create what, what Alex Redcorn, an Osage faculty member at K-State has talked about a, a curriculum overlay. Uh, because in Kansas, our school districts have the choice of how they, uh, of what like curriculum they use. There's standards, but they're relatively vague. And, and so we want to create content so that pe school districts that are choosing to add better content will have better things to look at when they're making those choices. Um, and I think that the treaty project would be a good one, but you know, Great Band Potawatomi has amazing relationships with the local school districts near them, um, with language in the schools and language for all the students, not just um, Potawatomi students. So I think you're going to see a lot more content like this, uh, but I do think it'll be a challenge. Like many of you right now didn't even know about this controversy I was talking about, right? It's going to be a challenge for us to make sure that people know about these things. And that's why I think we're all so grateful for all of you coming today, because the more people that know about these resources, the more you can share them with your networks. I think another place that would be interesting is the tribes have been displaced from putting yes. you know, getting history on yes, them. Yes, absolutely. Well. Yeah, yes, yeah, so like the Osage and the Pawnee and the Cheyenne, yeah. I mean, yes, that would be a wonderful, that would be wonderful. <laughs> I dream of this too. I bet Charlie does too. Charlie, I bet you dream of. I will add to that, that, that at the meeting that Ty was talking about, all the four tribes were at the table. I mean, it's a, you know, that, but it's a slow process. This has taken us more than a year and we're not nowhere near done with just this, you know, three treaties. Um, so, but I will add one more thing before I turn it to the next question, which is that I taught in Wisconsin before I was here, and in Wisconsin, if you were going to be a K through 12 teacher, it was required that you took at least one in class on Indigenous studies. It could be lit, it could be history, but you couldn't go into education without having one class, and I would love to see that um, be the case in Kansas. Thanks for putting this on this evening. Appreciate your insights. And your work, the work you've done. Curious when Ka Nation men were no longer allowed to hunt. It had to come with one of those treaties, I would assume. Is that anybody know? It's a little more complicated than that. Um, the dissolution of hunting uh, it came about not necessarily because of a specific law or treaty, but because the bison were hunted to the point of extinction. So, the uh, to the Kansa credit, the men hunted as long as they could, uh, but the bison started to not be there. So one of the things that started to happen, I, I, why am I the one talking about that? <laughs> <laughs> I rely on the good graces of these extremely knowledgeable folk. So uh, if I'm wrong, please cut me off. But uh, bison became 
something that was a bit of a novelty and a major economic driver. So bison skins and pelts became uh, something that was very lucrative to sell, uh, but it also became the, the cool thing to do to kill a bison. Like that was one of those things, if you were going out west to prove as a settler that you had gumption and you were really part of that movement, you would kill a bison. And so part of what happened is the bison got hunted to the point of extinction, so there didn't have to be a law passed. There just weren't any bison to and, hunt. Yeah, Charlie. And additionally, addi can you hear me? Yes. 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 Additionally, you have the problem of being, you know, we, we don't think about what it means to be on a reservation. Folks, it's illegal to leave your reservation, right? Our men would be killed if found, they would be killed if they were found on our reservation. Like that's a whole other problem is like, you know, settlers coming and killing us when we were on our reservations. But they would certainly be killed if they were found off reservation. So a hunt, right? where before you could go and you could hunt wherever you wanted, you would follow, right? You would follow the bison, right? You would follow Chidonga, right? You, you follow them where they went. And so you would have a potential um, for more success. Once we were stripped of, what was the statistic? Was it 94 or 96% yeah, of our land? Yeah. Once we were stripped of that possibility and confined, right? So the law, it's not, you don't have to make a law about hunting if you've made a law about where we can go. And we will be killed if we are found off reserve. Thank you. I think it's useful to ponder if current hunters were told that the only place they could hunt was on their land. No. What sort of <laughs> hue and cry there might be. <laughs> but there were there were many other hands. So you, you, okay. Question for Chester. There, the, the graphic that you put up. I don't think you can put it back up again. Just wanted to make sure that I understood correctly. You talked about the parcels. Yeah. You're available. I am assuming those were the parcels that Isaac Goodnow sold. Is that right? Yeah. What you're talking about? So, see, they were sold. So, sorry, I can't hear you. Yeah. Okay. That those were the parcels that were given to, to build the university, and Isaac Goodnow went around and sold them, and the money came back to the university. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Just check it. I want to make sure I got that right. Oh, yeah. So, let me add, it's a twofold thing then. So, Kansas State sits on Ka land, and then also these land parcels were taken and sold and turned into the university's endowment. So, so two things are happening at once there. Um, other, other folks, where should I go? Where should I go? I know you got thoughts and questions. Can you, can you show one more time where the annotations are and what they look like, just in case? And maybe I didn't turn it Yes, off no, I, I think that's a great idea. So uh, this site is currently located at the Chapman Center for Rural, Rural Studies website. You have the address on your handout. Uh, so when we, when we look at the drop-down menu, we have each treaty here. And what we have is the full text of the treaty that you can open up and take a look at. Um, and so that's just the treaty itself, but then underneath we've broken these down into individual articles with additional information on them. So you can pull up these articles and then we have uh, uh, annotations that we've created that have been created through conversations with scholars, through scholarly research, and other kinds of uh, uh, deep uh, dive historical work, uh, which is why I rely so much on these scholars here, uh, to help broaden the conversation and uh, help us understand what these legal documents are doing. Yeah. 
And right now, we just have a small portion of it up. And as I said earlier, by the end of the summer, the whole thing will be done. We actually have pages and pages and pages <laughs> in uh, folders that we're trying to make clean and pretty and consumable. So <laughs> thank you so much. Is this yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Honestly, this has been a really amazing. I've been impressed with this project at every presentation I've been at about it, and this one is no no exception. So thank you all for the work you're doing. This is a really nerdy question um, about the treaties. Are you are you mostly looking at the treaty sort of backwards in time, like what informed the treaty, or are you also annotating like what was violated? Because you mentioned that in your presentation. Okay, is it on? Okay, wonderful. Yeah, so both. Um, so I would, like, I, there were other people working on these treaties, like my research partner Haley worked on the Treaty of 1846, yeah. but I know for me personally, I was looking at information at, like, the time period, um, but also looking at things that would happen after. So, for example, like, when we're looking at some of the treaties and the articles, talk about, um, like, the land that was to be, like, provided, right? Um, and then I would go in and look at how like settlers in Kansas would continue to encroach on that land. So I would be looking at things like that, but also at the same time, look at some things that were happening around the same time. So like how the Ron Parks piece talked about like culture and um, culture norms, gender norms, I would be looking at that stuff as well. I really, really relied very heavily on the Ka Nation website and the Ka Nation Museum, which are wonderful sources if you want to learn more. Yeah, so absolutely. thanks for your question. Thanks so much. Can I add to your, yeah. can I, yes, hold, hold on. Yeah, go. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Charlie. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, she, she, <laughs> oh wait, we lost you. You, you, mute, you muted yourself. yourself, Charlie. <laughs> oh, there. I want to give you some nerdiness um, because for me, one of the things that's really key when you ask how we're approaching it, um, one of the one of the things is uh, that's really important is time, and to look at it from for me to look at it from a a, a, a Kansa perspective, and for for Ka people, um, you know, Mary and I kind of we get linguistically nerdy together sometimes because. <laughs> For uh, Kanza I, there's um, two primary tenses in language, uh, not three. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about language, we talk about um, the, the past and the present um, as, as one tense uh, in terms of the actual. So what has happened and is happening. And then we look at the future as a potential future. And so when I'm looking at these treaties, that's how I'm looking at them and how I'm approaching them. I'm looking at them as happening in the actual tense. So, awesome. nerdy question, nerdy answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hi, uh, I think this is probably more a question for Charlie, but I've noticed talking this we talk about the name a lot and like about the like the Kansas being named after the Kanza and I was kind of curious if that was just perpetuating their erasure in history and kind of if that was more of just like an insult to injury kind of thing just having like counties and like the state being named after the tribes because what I've seen it's always been kind of a celebrated thing that we've been <coughs> named after the Kanza, but we don't actually know their history. So I was kind of curious about that because I've noticed like talking about the name so much. Could you hear that, Charlie? No. Not very well. Okay, let me repeat. So to repeat it, what do you think about the of Kansas being named for the state being named for the Kanza, but then having very little acquaintance? And is it a problem that the state is named for a people in which it's not really acknowledged or connected to? Uh, you're trying to get me in trouble. <laughs> I didn't ask it. I just translated. I would know better. <laughs> oh, man, that's a big one. Yeah. I mean, you're going, you're going right for it. Um, 
You know, we we've, we've never been asked. I don't think, to my knowledge, um, officially. I don't know that the nation has ever been asked. Um, it's certainly not in any of the treaties that I've noticed. <laughs> um, you know, me personally. Um, I think they could have found another name. Uh, or at least let us keep some land. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's, um, yeah, it's problematic. Uh, it's definitely problematic uh, for me. I, I like to think of problematic things as jumping off places. Um, you know? Uh, I like to think that, you know, we can look at Kansas and say, well, you know, you've got this great name and we know where it comes from. <laughs> so maybe we can get a great, you know, K through 12 curriculum going. How about it? Um, you know, is, is my, I like to think positively about such things. Um, you know, but I, I do, uh, you know, I, I do question um, the mindset of, of the people that did that, you know, and why when I look at Juje um, Wafove and I see the plaque that, you know, they, they put on, on him and, you know, they dedicated it what does it say, Todd, to the pioneers? The pioneers. Uh, yeah, uh-huh, yes, that's what it says. You know, you know, and you just think, like, why? Why would you steal somebody's, why would you steal somebody's rock? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and to me it's baffling. You know, why would you steal somebody's rock? Why would you steal somebody's name? Like, it just doesn't. It doesn't make sense, but that is what that is what conquering armies do, you know. And we have a really hard time sometimes framing it like that because you know we think, oh, they're farmers, they're settlers, they're you know nice church-going people, and you know we have our own ideas. You know, I myself am, am mixed. I'm not from you know. I wasn't born in Kansas. I'm not. You know, um, you know, we have our own histories and our own stories about our own families and, you know, but at the end of the day, you know, it, it displaces other people, you know, and there's a methodology involved and, you know, it's, it's real, you know. Chester's people were, they didn't get there by accident, like they didn't, like he didn't just wake up there like they had to walk yeah. right like yeah. they had to walk and people died along the way right right and then they got put into a hostile environment that was not familiar to them and they got told survive um so you know i i like to think that these moments of visibility are moments where we can reach out and um, teach. But is it upsetting? I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that might be a great place to wrap it up. Yeah. So I would like to conclude uh, on a couple of notes. So one, uh, first of all, I would like to thank Kansas Humanities. Uh, this work has been a lot, and a lot of people have worked on this, and without their support, we wouldn't be able to devote the time to this. We would also like to uh, end our talk on some parting actions. Uh, so knowing that we're in a state that whose namesake nation has been pushed out of the state, we can start to think about how we can educate ourselves, whoever we are, 
So thinking about the K-State land acknowledgement and their discussions, thinking about going to the Ka Nation website, which is incredible and has amazing, amazing language resources on there. So cool. Um, thinking about informing, uh, learning about the uh, Sacred Red Rock Project uh, in Juje Wakoba, uh, thinking about getting involved and educating ourselves and educating others too. I think that's also very important. Um, I would like to thank everybody on the panel. Uh, we are happy to continue talking. Uh, we also want to respect your time, uh, and uh, we thank you for coming out tonight. Thanks.